Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. And I'm Kevin Graham. And I'm Colin Watt. And today we are joined by John McAnally Jr. from Rio Fender. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, John. How are you? I'm great. Thanks very much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. I um, have been listening to your music online. You've recently released an album, so we'll talk all about that. But first of all, we'll have a wee chat about Celtic. Yeah. Talk to me about your Celtic upbringing. Okay, uh, well... I'm from a family that grew up in the east end of Glasgow, so all my family are all Celtic daft, even though I'm from the east coast. Um, so I was dragged through at Celtic Park regularly from about age nine, I think. It just seems like forever ago. Um, and me and my dad, my sister and my nephew were season ticket holders throughout my, my childhood. Uh, fond memories. So who was your first Celtic team? Um Tom Boyd, possibly, as captain. Uh, aye, Tosh McKinley. Uh, John Collins, I think, was probably the, the, the kind of goal-scoring idol back then. And the rest of the team escapes me just now, but that, that sort of era, anyway. So we're sort of looking at early 90s, 93, yeah. 94, yeah, round that, about that that's, time that's when, on. when Boyd and that. Did, so yeah. did you have a season ticket at that time? Aye, aye, we were season ticket holders right down in the front row in the south stand. Um, great seats, especially for a wee guy. You know, you don't need to worry about uh, getting your your view impeded. And we're pretty close to the away fans as well, so that always had that added wee uh, excitement factor of getting a bit of verbals with the, the visiting support. So when you think back to your your childhood, as you say, you, you come from uh, outside of Glasgow. What yeah. about uh, your upbringing? You lived in a wee place called I say a wee place called Pennycook. That's right. Yeah. What type of place was Pennycook? And in, in terms of Celtic supporters, was there a stronghold there? Uh, not especially. No, it's quite. Uh, it's obviously Hearts and, and Hibs. I've got a, a, a good support there. I, although I, I lived in Pennycook, I travelled to go to the Catholic school. Uh, a few miles down the road so generally all the Celtic fans were on that same bus with me every morning getting bussed out of Pennycook and then getting bussed back in the afternoon so probably between about 9am and 3pm there was no Celtic fans in Pennycook at all (laughs) (laughs) I mean travelling through with uh, your old man and and all that that's part of the experience of being indoctrinated into this club you're a musician let's talk about the music and let's talk about the connection between Celtic and music something that crops up all the time on a Celtic state of mind, John, is that yeah. something that it's it's omnipresent when you're a young guy going to the Celtic games? But did you realise that Celtic fans were that wee bit different and a wee bit more unique when it came to just the 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 amount of songs that we've got and the meaning of many of those songs in terms of the club's heritage? Um, well, I think it probably took me a while to realise that that was just a Celtic thing because my my family are all I, like I said they're all Celtic fans and they're all musicians as well. I've got a couple of cousins that, that play guitar and various different instruments, banjo, and a family get-together for us was always just a circle of guys sitting playing instruments and singing songs. And, uh, Pity I, the neighbours. I, oh, I know, I know. Well, the, 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 the select few neighbours would get invited, but the rest of them would all be, uh, all be spitting feathers. Um, but I, I just assumed that was, that was what everybody did until I started to grow up and realised that we were kind of unique in that sense. But that is, that's definitely a kind of a, a Celtic philosophy, that, isn't it? It definitely is, aye. And I mean, we've asked so many people from all walks of life uh, what it is that makes the Celtic love affair with music different. And there's so many clubs out there that are, are singing generic songs, aye. and many of them sing our songs. Oh, uh, definitely, aye. You know, and uh, claim them as their own. And I just think there is a unique creativity uh, amongst the Celtic support you being a prime example of that, because obviously you are creating at the moment your own works of art through your music. John, talk to us about um, not just your introduction into music, as you've just uh, explained there, but when did you start picking up a guitar yourself and, and learning to play and write songs? Um, well, funnily enough, it wasn't until I was about 20 
I actually picked up the guitar because as a as a younger child, I was uh, I was railroaded into playing the violin at, at primary school, and I was pretty decent at it. But I soon realised that being a violin player at high school was wasn't really a path. <laughs> it's not going to get you any woman. Uh, no. Exactly. No. Aye, <laughs> that's that's that would have been the least of my concerns. So I, I I gave that up because I wanted to play the guitar then, but the school wouldn't have it because I was a violin player and they wanted to keep me playing the violin. So I gave it up for, for my whole rest of my school career and then picked it up myself when I was about 20. And uh, obviously having guitar players around me and whatnot helped, but I never had any formal tuition or that. I just sort of picked up books, learned learned how to play and, and, and took pointers from all the musicians I was lucky enough to have at hand. How did that transform from getting to know the, the instrument and, and learn to play songs, etc., to you actually having a band? Did you have any uh, previous bands prior to what we're going to be speaking about today? No, not, not really. Um, I, I used to just play guitar by myself um, at parties and in the campsite at Tea in the Park and you know things <laughs> like that. And, and, and I was always getting a good reception and people would say, you need to do something with us, you know. And I... I, I Ignored that advice for a good decade and then finally started to, to get it together and, and make something a bit more. What interested me, Kevin, I saw the artwork. I saw the artwork on it. Again, uh, going back to this creativity here, and I keep blowing that trumpet, but there's a there's a lass on Twitter called Made by Frankie who does a lot of the artwork and yeah. she's started doing things for the Scottish national team and, and BBC and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. She did your artwork, she didn't did, she? Yeah. So yeah, how did you get to know? Was it the same as myself? I just saw a lot of Celtic stuff she was doing. I more or less. I, I'd, I'd been a follower of hers for a while and I loved the, the style. And uh, it, it just occurred to me out of the blue one day to just contact her and see if she'd be interested in doing it. And she said aye, which was a bit of a surprise, to be honest. I kind of expected that she she would uh, have a, a polite reason for, for refusing, but she took it on and she was really good at managing to uh, to create what I'd described just using words, you know, that, that's a really difficult thing. I've never actually even had a, a conversation with her. It was all done through emails and through Twitter and things like that. So I think that's a real testament to her ability to take words off a page and turn it into what she's managed to do, which was exactly the, the image that I had in my head, you know. And when you see it, it's so distinctively made by Frankie, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it really yeah, is. When you right. see it, you, you could guess that she had done that. And I, I guess when I saw that, I had seen you playing a um, acoustically and stuff like that on videos on, on social media but when I saw the artwork that was me then realising that you had got a band uh, or uh, you were writing an album so it works both ways the, the fact that uh, I was familiar with her work and yeah. she put me back onto yourself who I was already aware of so personally I think the artwork's tremendous I think the, yeah. the sounds that I've heard so far are fantastic could you tell us John what is going to be the first song you're going to play for us today and tell us a wee bit about that song uh, so this song is called We'll See and uh, it's one of the first songs that I ever wrote and it's it's one of those songs that I suppose I've, I've alluded to earlier that I used to play at parties back in the day and people would say, oh, that's really good, you should record that, you know. And, um, so I thought it was, it was only right that I would play that one today because it kind of marks out where the journey started, so to speak. <laughs> I want a purpose I want to get up in the morning And know that it's worth it I want a mission I want to shout out loud And know that someone is listening I don't want to be king or a VIP or the CEO of a PLC I don't want the latest MP3 or a GTI that plays DVDs I don't want a new IBM PC or an LED HDTV 
I want to stay clear of the CID and avoid another LTP. And I'm not gonna make it to the World Cup, but I'll score a hat trick for my local pub. I'm not gonna be a millionaire, and I might get fat and maybe lose my hair. I'll probably never sell a platinum CD, but I'll still sing about what's happening to me and what will become of me. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I'm gonna start over. I'm gonna exercise my demons, and I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna focus, but it's gonna be a mountain to climb. I hope that you know this. I don't wanna spend my life watching BBC or ITV till I'm an OAP. Okay, I had a dabble with some LSD, but mostly just the XTC and THC. My DNA will always make me OTT, but you can keep me stable with your TLC. And baby, if I've got your LOVE, then I'll be OTM until I'm RIP. And I'm not gonna make it to the World Cup, but I'll score a hat trick for my local pub. I'm not gonna be a millionaire, and I might get fat and maybe lose my hair. I'll probably never sell a platinum CD, but I'll still sing about what's happening to me and what will become of me. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. You mentioned that you used to be a violin player. Aye. So this week I read an interview with Johnny Greenwood for Radiohead. Right. And obviously he's a classical composer as well now, eh? Oh, right, right. And he says that violin players can do far more than guitar players. What's your view on that? Do you mean with a, a violin? or well, With their fingers. <laughs> they, 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 they can do more with a violin than, than a guitar player can do. It's a controversial point of view, I suppose. I mean, the, the violin's a lot smaller, Um I, I, I guess he's right. I suppose you've got a bow, and the bow gives you that flexibility as well. Um, but it's difficult for me to to say because the violin was a distant memory for me, and uh, the, the guitars really all I've, I've been focused on for the last number of years now. So there's no violin on the album, then? Is there uh, no, no wonder stuff type? No, I did. I did consider it though. Actually, a few years back, I bought myself another violin uh, to see if I could still play it, and it turns out I can't. So <laughs> that was the end of that. Remember the hidden track on Set and Coming, the Fawz right. track aye, ninety nine. That's what you need to do. Get the uh, violin back, out, John. Oh uh, well, I, I don't know if I kept it in the end, but I'll, I'll have a look. What's your writing process then when you're when you're doing songs? Do you sit down? Do you set time away, or what um, do you do? How how does the inspiration come? Uh, that's that's a question that I've often asked myself. To be honest, uh, there's there's no pattern to it, and uh, I, I definitely don't sit down with the intention of, of writing a song. If I try and do that, then my mind will just disappear off somewhere else and it just has to come when it comes, really. Um, and I, I would often just write things down 
when if I've got an idea for a lyric in my head, I just write it down. And at one stage, I had it. It was all on my phone eventually, and, and, and like the kind of notes thing in my phone. And I had pages and pages of just lyrics that didn't necessarily form a song, but I would then pick bits out of that and make songs out of it. And so that that's a kind of lyrical process. And the same would apply for the the music. I'd just be playing about my guitar, thinking of little chord structures, thinking of little riffs that go together, and then looking at these banks of lyrics and seeing if any of the two might fit. And fortunately enough, they did, <laughs> in, uh, in, in enough cases to throw an album together. Tom Boyd, Tosh McKinley, John yeah. Collins, these are names that are familiar to me as a guy who started going as a season ticket holder in 94. And, you know, for me, Collins was a classy player at a time where we went through dark years and then the transition. And uh, now, Collins, we saw him a couple of Thursdays ago at the game and uh, he didn't get a very good reception when he oh, walked really? past. Why do you think that is about ex-Celtic players that uh, the fans don't have a real affinity with once they leave the club? Well, in the case of John Collins, I really am at a loss to, to explain that because, like I say, he was my talisman. So maybe that... that tilts my uh, my bias a bit but I was also lucky enough to meet him um, long after his, his playing career finished and he couldn't have been nicer as well so for that reason I'm a little bit blinkered when it comes to John Collins and I can't really uh, offer a- any reasons why anybody wouldn't like him Here's a thing about Collins, it must have been 87, 88 he came to Sacred Heart Primary School in Pennycook right. wearing the best shell suit you can imagine <laughs> to present all the awards and I've kind of loved them ever since I always wanted them to sign for Celtic I've seen a thread today an interesting thread from uh, Stevie Murray the players you always wanted to sign for Celtic and they didn't sign well Collins was one of the guys that when he finally did you just thought he's a Celtic player yeah. he, you know he was a class class player for Hibs yeah. and, and and always against Celtic so I, I'm, I'm in the same camp as you I quite yeah. like John Collins I wouldn't say it I'd welcome him back as a manager no, but uh, I do like him yeah. and he's not in that category of guys that we wouldn't have on this podcast I mean I think the problem with Collins you've got is he's part of the Dyla era and the Dyla era is very split across mm. the Celtic fan base and the stories that come out from the, the Dyla era about John Collins are either that he's a great guy or that he's a complete show off and that he'd walk about with his six pack open in the changing room so I don't know Maybe that's got a slight impact on how a lot of people look upon John Collins nowadays, um, but I can't really say much about him, his playing career because I think I was still in nappies at the time. So he was, oh, you're uh, just showing off. Cheers for that, Colin. Eh? Hi. He was he was walking about with his six pack out in the change room when I met him. By the way, that's uh, that's that's the truth. <laughs> so it's a true story <laughs> then. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, him, him and Big Yogi, I think, had um, memberships at a golf club down on the east coast. And I was there for a works function. They, they had a, a conference room and that, and we, we were there. I was sitting eating my breakfast, and I thought, that's Yogi and John Collins there. And I said to a woman that I work with, I said, that's, that's two of my, my boyhood idols there. And she, go, she, she says, oh, I'll go and, I'll go and get them. I'll, I'll get them over to meet you. I said, no, don't be daft. Just, just let them get on with their day, sort of thing. But she'd done it anyway. But five minutes later, and they, they, they were away into the changing room. But she managed to get Yogi before he went in. So... He came over and he was really nice as well and quite happy to sit and chat for a bit. And he says, "Come in and meet John." And I'm going, "No, I don't, you know, don't, don't bother." No, no, when you come, when you come. So he takes me into the changing room and John's sitting there with a towel wrapped around his waist and nothing else on. And he, he, you know, <laughs> under the circumstances, I would have forgiven him for not being uh, too too happy for a meet and greet. But he, he'd done it and he was great. <laughs> See the thing with Collins and, and Hughes, they're obviously big mates. They go cycling in that together. Right. It's, obviously, they're into their keep their keep fit regimes. I sometimes wonder people like that uh, who are kind of lost to Scottish football at the moment. You know, there's teams out there who would do well to employ a, a, a team like Collins and Hughes. You know, and uh, I'm not saying Celtic. I don't think they're Celtic kind of level or standard. But there's there's guys in jobs that you know you sometimes wonder, particularly in the Premiership why on earth are they always in a job and you've got people like Collins who's got an incredible amount of experience internationally over in France down in England and surely he can implement that somewhere in Scottish football would would you agree with that Colin you think he's a a big loss at that level it's a hard one to say I mean he's had his chance both of them have had their chances Um, but the way Collins comes across I think he's more suited to developing the youngsters 
because I think he's got that mentality that if you put that into the young players coming through nowadays, then you might actually see a change because they were winners. They went on the park and they wanted to win. And I think that's the problem we've got, especially in the national team these days, is that we go out on the park and the minute we've stepped on the park, we've lost the game. And I think there's not enough winners in the team. We've got great, great players, Champions League winners, but we've not got that mentality of winning a game. And I think that's what holds us back at the minute. I think with Collins as well, uh, it's well documented that he has a Marmite character. There's some players love him, some players actually yep. hate him. When I think back to the playing days, I'm actually, I'm really just blessed that we saw John Collins and Paul McStay for five years ago. Yep. And even though it was a tough time for being a Celtic fan, you look back at certain games and I wrote about the, a 2-0 victory at Ibrox when both of them scored. Both of them were absolutely immense that day. And they were the two best midfielders in Scotland on their day. And the fact that they stayed at Celtic as long in the turmoil that we were, were actually in uh, mm. actually says, for me, says a lot about them. Actually says it says a lot about them. The big man says, Collins was a fantastic footballer. Mm -hmm. He was the best midfielder in Scotland when we signed him. Uh, it's well known that Sunas actually wanted to sign him as well. And for him to come to Celtic, where we were at that point, says a lot about Collins. And for me, he'll always have, I'll always have a lot of time for John Collins, definitely. Absolutely. Another great story that I love about Big Yogi is the first job he was given in the, you know, the game against Newcastle. It was the, the pre-season game to open the stand at Celtic Park. Or in fact, it was to open, reopen the stadium, wasn't it? The Newcastle game. And Tommy Burns sent him to the airport to pick up Rod Stewart. Because Big Yogi couldn't play, but Rod Stewart was to cut the ribbon. The ribbon he was to cut the ribbon for the, the opening of Celtic Park. So that was Big Yogi's uh, introduction to Celtic. Go and pick up Rod Stewart for the Aye. for the airport. Going back to, to music, what actually are your music influences, John? When you go back to getting into, you know, going to gigs and all this kind of stuff, who who were you listening to? Um, well, I, I grew up in the sort of Britpop era, so I was a Oasis fan, Blur. Pulp. Um, that was that was everything that was going on when I was first becoming musically aware. Um, but again, having this wider family uh, that are all very musical and very musically aware, I was uh, exposed to everything from like, the Beatles right the way up to, to to modern music when when I was young. So I think that that gave me a really good eclectic taste in music. Um, and I do like a bit of everything, but if if I have to to really whittle it down to a favourite, then anything with <clears throat> loud clangy guitars is does does the trick for me. I like that description, clangy. Uh, clangy. The clangy, uh, the clangers. The clangy uh, guitars. The fact that that takes us back, the clangers, the soup dragon was a, a character huh? for the clangers, so it all oh, ties yeah, in because we had the soup dragon's drummer on last uh, week. So, yeah, if you've you not go. listened to that one, go back and listen to it. Right? <laughs> Absolutely, <Yeah>. good plug. <laughs> so, John, tell us about the second song you're going to play for us today. Um, the second song is called Savages in Savile Row Suits, and uh, it's just it's a song I wrote a few years ago, but it seems to be coming more and more pertinent as. Uh, as we go forward, and it's just basically a, a, my reaction to uh, horrible men in sharp suits that are making horrible decisions and uh, have no regard for the, the impact of their horrible behaviour. And most of them are involved in football. <laughs> it's, it's not about the SFA, if that's what you were thinking, but no, gen, gen, just generally uh, a kind of commentary on the, on the state of things. <laughs> Savages in Savile Row suits Briefcase Italian leather boots Sowing bloodshed and trying to reap peace Pouring poison to cure the disease You never learned the lessons, never learned the lessons Never learned the lessons that you ought to Fight a fire with fire When you should have used water And you've done the dirty work In the devil's hours and we've to pay the price, now the debt is ours. I could have wrote you a love song and made you smile. And 
Left you looking at the world through covered eyes I could have wrote you a love song, made you warm inside And left you looking at the world in its disguise It's true, helping a man when he doesn't need help isn't really helping at all. He's got to learn how to struggle, learn how to fight, how to stand up when he falls. But the fight is fixed, the fight is fixed, the fight is fixed. The game is rigged, the dice are weighted, so he never rolls a six, never rolls a six. Oh, and you've done the dirty work in the devil's hours. And we've to pay the price, now the debt is ours I could have wrote you a love song and made you smile And left you looking at the world through covered eyes Yeah, I could have wrote you a love song, made you warm inside And left you looking at the world in its disguise Oh, God made man and man made the borders God showed us love and man gave us orders But greater than the force of a mighty army Is the power of an idea whose time has come Oh, but you've done the dirty work in the devil's hours And we've to pay the price, now the debt is ours Love song and made you smile And left you looking at the world through covered eyes Yeah, I could have wrote you a love song, made you warm inside And left you looking at the world in its disguise The savage in the Savile Row suit Has a bag on his back that says loot It's yours and it's mine But he says with a smile Do as I say Not as I do Do as I say Not as I do Do as I say not as I do, do as I say, not as I do, do as I say, not as I do. So, John, you have released your debut album. Tell us yeah. where we can get that. Where can we access your music? Uh, right now it's available on the Bandcamp platform. So if you if you look up Bandcamp and type in Rio Fender, so it's uh, a little play on words, that's, that's where you can get it just now. Um, that was the easiest way to get it out nice and quickly. And uh, in the next wee while, we'll be looking at putting it out on all this kind of bigger platforms uh, Apple and Google and all that kind of carry on and for all the listeners out there we'll also have the link to your your album in the description of this podcast so John your yeah. third and final song tell us a wee bit about that uh, <clears throat> this last song is called Artemis and Apollo 
Great titles, eh? Oh, I know. Fantastic I know. titles. Thank you. And uh, Artemis and Apollo were, were brother and sister in Greek mythology. And I've, I've got three sisters of my own, but I also used to have a lot of friends who were female as well. And it's just kind of song a little bit about that relationship that you have with women that isn't about being in love with them, you know? That's, that's probably the best way I can describe it. Much, 
But can we keep in touch? Can we keep in touch? Uh, the only thing that's left for me to say, John, is uh, thank you for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind. Ah, the privilege is all mine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Brilliant, John. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 